Hello and welcome back, folks. This is a lecture on Chapter 15, which is about delivering presentations. Now, once again, I thought it'd be appropriate to start us off with a video. And since we started off with The Office, why not end up there, right? Uh, so one of my favorite clips from The Office is called Prison Mike. And uh, if you haven't watched this clip, uh, go and watch it uh, before uh, the rest of this lecture. But as you're, you're watching it, uh, be thinking about uh, what is, uh, you know, where's the source of this comedy? What is not working here? <laughs> and what is Mike's goals, uh, Michael, uh, Michael's goals, and where's he going wrong? Uh, but also maybe where's he going? Is he doing anything uh, well? Is he doing anything right? I think you'll see that some things he does pretty well, actually, uh, according to this uh, chapter. <laughs> and of course, others are horribly wrong. So anyway, enjoy the clip. I uh, reflect on it a little bit, and then I'll come back and we'll uh, resume. All right, and here are the uh, objectives for today. Uh, we have six. Uh, we'll start by describing how the presentation delivery impacts your credibility. And we'll break that credibility into the three C's. And we'll talk about presentations with authenticity. I think you might already be thinking that might <laughs> might have been where <laughs> Michael uh, Scott went wrong. Uh, was prison Mike really authentic? Uh, the confidence and well as the uh, influence. Uh, 15.3, applying the soften method. I'll break down what that uh, soften stands for. Model of nonverbal communication for presentation. So a lot of people neglect this idea of body language, uh, the tone, the pitch, you know, all this sort of stuff. It's just as really is just as important as what your content is or what you're saying, uh, how you're saying it, how you're holding yourself, etc. Uh, it's very important. Uh, 15.4, using slides and handouts to supplement your presentation effectively. I like this idea of supplementing it, not substituting for it. Uh, we'll interact, 15.5, uh, interact effectively with your audience, uh, which, you know, maybe Michael did that. <laughs> maybe he didn't. <laughs> and then that preparing to present effectively in teams, another a thing that often gets neglected in courses like this, but it's really important because a lot of the times you won't, you won't be up there by yourself. Uh, you might be up there as part of a panel or, uh, you know, even in student projects, you might have presented as a team. It's a different skill set, really. Uh, so there's our chapter overview. You can see how everything more or less follows the uh, those learning principles. All right, so we'll give you an, uh, an overview first, and then we'll go into each one of these uh, areas. Uh, but the first uh, concept here is about presence. You want the, uh, the focus to be on you, people to be learning from you, uh, giving them, uh, you know, value for their time, basically, and possibly their money if they paid to see you. Uh, so these are some principles, and again, we're going to go into each of these. Uh, first, of course, establishing your credibility. You know, who are you to be saying this stuff? Why should they listen to you? Uh, maintaining authenticity. Uh, how do they know you're being uh, uh, honest and legitimate? <laughs> Not coming across as insincere or fake somehow. Uh, knowing the material and rehearsing properly. Uh, this fourth one is probably what most people ask me about more than anything, is how do you overcome the fear? Of public speaking and and you'll find that uh, the professionals say you really shouldn't ever just overcome it completely <laughs> it's okay to be a little nervous and uh, it's a good sign i think uh, we'll talk more about this but people that say that they never get nervous or they have no fear uh, i i fear <laughs> i fear uh, that they just are oblivious and they're not really uh you know, cognizant always of the effects they have on their audience. They're almost a little too uh, self-absorbed. Uh, maybe they should be a little more nervous. Uh, and then focusing on the people. Again, so it's not always about the uh, the content so much as, you know, what is the actual situation? I'm sure you've been in situations as a student where, the, you know, it seemed like the content was all the uh, you know, teacher cared about, wasn't really willing to change things. <laughs> depending on circumstances in the classroom. A, a little too ri rigid, yeah, flexible, a little inflexible uh, with that learning plan, lesson plan. Sometimes they have to be, they don't have control. Uh, but usually it's better to be able to adapt to your audience. Uh, a lot of this stuff I learned about not from uh, communications or English classes, but rather just being an amateur musician and going to lots of uh, you know local bands in the college town I grew up in. And you, I could really see the difference between a band that had been doing it for a while and was able to adapt 
uh, to their audience sometimes on the fly you know what song not just what songs they would play but the you know the way they would talk to that audience uh the uh you know how <laughs> should they go the the solos you know everything that uh was kind of improvised basically uh, to fit the conditions that they were performing in you know that was a, a very professional band would be like that whereas the really sort of rougher rougher bands the bands that didn't go over too well uh, they tended to have a too rigid of a plan right and they would just do the same thing every time no matter what uh, so a lot of this stuff would apply even if we're not talking about business communication <laughs> even if you, you know if you want to be a poet uh if you want to uh you know be in an amateur band you know a lot of the stuff would apply uh, you know communicating non-verbally and then dressing for success and again <laughs> now i'm thinking about bands like even come back to that one because uh, I, I remember talking to uh one of these musicians and I always like to talk to the ones that had been doing it their whole lives because they would have a lot to say on each one of these topics but I remember asking this uh, a rock guitarist one time uh, again not a band you'd heard of just somebody that had played in lots of bands you know his whole life and I, I talked to him, I asked him why is it that these bands tend to dress so <laughs> extremely <laughs> uh, basically you know they always look sort of uh, uh you know the the leather or the bright colors you know whatever it is and uh, i remember he said but, well that's because you really have to stand out you know you really don't want to look like a member of the audience uh, that's part of the, the key to being uh, noticed of <laughs> basically establishing some distance between you and the audience uh and i thought about that and some of the different movements going on in music at that time like the grunge scene uh, where that was really uh you know some of those bands didn't really seem to dress all that differently i mean if you compare say uh, nirvana to um oh i don't know queen <laughs> or kiss even you really see a difference in the way they dress but anyway i'm going way off topic here uh, so hopefully that is interesting for you to think about as well uh, you can learn a lot about uh, business presentations uh, from looking at any kind of presentation uh, anything from a sermon you might hear at a church uh, to uh, political speeches you know try to think beyond just the uh, <laughs> the stereotypical business presentation because uh, there's a lot to learn uh, all over the place uh, anyway let's see uh, establishing credibility uh, one of two so we'll talk about the internal presentation first which just means you're presenting to your uh, your office mates your classmates you know people that work for you uh, just like Michael Scott's presentation he, he gives a lot of those throughout the series <laughs> where he's just talking to his uh his staff basically uh, so they say that these uh, internal presentations provide the opportunity to change others views of you so you could ask how did michael do uh, with that uh, so the three c's of credibility in case you forgot are competence caring and character so you could think the competence <laughs> it probably didn't make him seem more competent <laughs> as a manager they, they seem like they already kind of have a low opinion of his competence so that probably didn't change uh caring in character though i think it could maybe they might have felt like well he does seem to care about us uh, even no matter how misguided it is it does seem like his heart's usually in the right place and the same thing with the character you know you don't tend to think of uh, michael as being a villain uh so much as a kind of a comic fool i suppose you could think about it in that way uh, but it doesn't seem dishonest or unethical at least not deliberately uh, so then we go on to say without appearing self-serving you can use these internal presentations to find ways to increase your perceived credibility you know my thought there is there's a bible verse that goes along the lines of uh, no man is a prophet in his hometown and you might have heard i don't know if that's i don't remember the exact wording but it's something along those lines you know and the idea is that it's kind of hard to impress people that see you every day that know you well to have a sort of fixed idea of the the person you are uh, even if you develop a lot of uh, a skill in a certain area and they might have a hard time taking you uh, seriously and this is a lot of times why it's advisable in your career to move at some point you know relocate get a job at another place where they don't know you so you can kind of start over because uh, if you're working at the same place the whole time it can be very hard to escape uh, this 
yeah, this uh, perceived credibility. You know, so they, they might think that you're good at one thing, maybe not recognize this uh, other skill that you have just because they, <laughs> they basically know you too well. <laughs> uh, but you could use these internal presentations as a way uh, to challenge that, maybe really show them, you know, I do know this, 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 this stuff. And again, a good example from the office is uh, the character Pam, who starts off uh, uh, basically being, uh, what I don't know what's her title. She works at the front desk, basic receptionist, I suppose. Uh, but then later becomes a salesperson and there's a lot of the tension in, in those episodes uh, you know revolves around this idea and if i unless it, if i recall correctly she does give at some point a, an internal presentation that begins to change uh, that view all right establishing credibility two of two now we're talking about the external presentation and so if you remember back to that first clip from the office we watched where michael went to that university, community college, wherever that was, <laughs> talking to the business students. <laughs> now, that was an external presentation, right? He didn't work, those weren't his employees, they didn't know him. Uh, so it's a very different situation. And they say you're often dealing with people who have a superficial impression of your credibility. Uh, so they don't really know you too well. You, know, you might have somebody come in and introduce you and uh, say, here's, you know, here's Barton. <laughs> He's a professor at St. Cloud State. He's written lots of books on this and that, lots of articles. So you might think, oh, okay, that's, well, that's that sounds good. <laughs> uh, but you don't really know too well. So a lot of this will be uh, establishing that competence by, by showing uh, that you know the content well. Because again, they don't know you well enough to know whether you have it or not. It could just be, <laughs> it could be a poser. <laughs> you know, I was watching this uh, Democracy Now! video uh, yesterday, and they had Noam Chomsky up there talking about uh, dem well, democracy, right? the challenges to democracy. And I thought it was uh, funny because at the bottom they had sort of his uh, in this little title card said that he was a linguist and author. <laughs> the linguist and author. Wow, uh, that's is that who Noam Chomsky? <laughs> you know, uh, you know. I guess I sort of been following him for a while. I, th I thought people would know. Uh, more about him than that but I was, I was trying to imagine like somebody that would go to that sh um, talk no idea who the guy is and just see that a uh, linguist and author you know they didn't even say what author of what <laughs> and what does a linguist uh, have to do with uh, uh, these political topics and uh, so that was a good example there you know I could imagine people having this very superficial impression not realizing you know how uh, basically famous and influential he's been uh, but, you know, on the positive note, I think by what he was saying and the, the sort of level of the discourse, I think people began to be, even if somebody had never heard him speak before, uh, they probably came away with a you know, pretty good impression. All right, on to authenticity. <laughs> probably where Michael failed the, the most uh, with his efforts there as prison Mike. Uh, so maintaining authenticity, that sounds great, right? Just <laughs> all I got to do is act natural. <laughs> Pretty sure there's a monkey song along those lines. Uh, but, or is it the Beatles? Anyway, uh, this is what everybody will tell you. It's kind of the standard advice, right? Just just go up there and be yourself. <laughs> just be, be yourself. <laughs> uh, don't try to imitate uh, somebody, somebody else. You know, Howard Stern or <laughs> whoever it is. Definitely don't imitate him up, uh, up there. But uh, what does this actually mean? And so they talk about finding your, uh, finding ways to present this real self uh, to your audiences. And I, I don't know. you know, in my experience, I don't know how much mileage you can get out of advice like this. I tend to think instead to find, uh, I, I tend to think more about personas that you develop. You know, people talk about a radio voice, uh, television persona. <laughs> you, you probably don't want to speak the same way you would uh, at home. Uh, just in casual conversation when you're delivering a presentation, right? There's a different a sort of, uh, they call it, they talk about a repertoire here. That <laughs> that sounds pretty good. Uh, but anyway, the, I think the key is to find something you're comfortable with and that you can do uh, sort of a style that works for you. Well, I think that's the key, not so much be yourself as find something that works <laughs> for you. <laughs> uh, you know, just like most people don't wear business formal clothes at home, uh, 
you know, but if you do have to wear formal clothes, business formal, uh, you can certainly find suits <laughs> that feel more comfortable, that feel more uh, natural to you than others that just feel totally, uh, you know, like something you would never wear and you feel totally out of, uh, you know, out of your comfort zone. I don't even quite know what I'm saying here anymore, but, <laughs> uh, but, you know, don't worry so much about being natural uh, or being, uh, you know, being uh, authentic uh, than being comfortable, I guess is what I, is how I would put that. Uh, by running through your presentation several times, uh, you allow yourself to do the following. Yeah, so here we're talking about the importance of uh, rehearsing and knowing the material. And this, to me, probably makes more of a difference than anything else. Uh, you know, of course, you can overdo it. Uh, but to the extent that you do, that you're not having to sweat about <laughs> what's the next slide. <laughs> uh, or, uh, oh, my God, uh, you know, I don't know. I haven't ever given this presentation before. I don't know what kind of questions I might get. You know, to the extent that you've done it over and over, either for real or just uh, rehearsed it in front of friends and family or at the right place. You know, a lot of people don't realize if you go to the right place for help with a presentation, uh, they have a room next door you can go to and, and give the presentation and have the uh, the consultant there uh, to watch and ask questions. You know, basically just run through it all. And I just really, really think it helps. And it's just, I think that's the worst thing you can do is never is not go through the presentation, not rehearse it. Uh, I think it almost always makes you look unprepared and uh, you do a lot worse job. Uh, even if, you you know, it's never going to be exactly like you rehearsed, uh, but it's more about this, just being more comfortable with it uh, will make the difference. And again, you can, coming back to the bands again, <laughs> you can always tell the bands <laughs> that have uh, rehearsed. And that's another big difference between the professionals and the amateurs. You know, the professionals, they, maybe they know each, every song back and forth. They played it thousands of times, yet they will still rehearse their shows. And you think, why would they, those folks need rehearsing? My God, you know, they've <laughs> done this how many times? Why are they rehearsing? Uh, but, you know, it's even, that's a lesson to be, you should learn from them, right? Uh, they're doing that so they can be more comfortable, uh, so they can, I guess, get back in the groove, uh, so they're not rediscovering all that on stage uh, when it's <laughs> go time, so to speak. So, yeah, making yourself comfortable with it, with the presentation, going through it repeatedly uh, really helps. Uh, working out the weekly connected areas, we kind of touched on that last time with the organizing the PowerPoint. But as you're going through it, you might have a little ideas. Just, you know what? I didn't really talk about this. That's the nice thing about rehearsing and is you can stop and add, add the slide or take away the slide or add a little bit better transition, you know, whatever you need to do. It's not necessarily apparent to you as you're designing the slides, but when you're rehearsing it, it suddenly might become visible. Is identifying parts that you want to emphasize through the tone of the voice as well as a nonverbal communication, right? <laughs> uh, again, kind of weird to talk about nonverbal communication uh, in this context, but again, we could be talking about the tone of your voice. Uh, maybe there's a sound effect you want to have at <laughs> that spot. Who knows? All right, and here we have a, a table, uh, the top fears of American adults. And I'm pretty sure the book said this was from a Gallup poll. I've been doing a lot of uh, my own research lately in terms of uh, research methods. <laughs> they talked a lot about polling and uh, Gallup is one of the uh, most famous polls that are out there. And they, it's actually kind of interesting, the stuff that they uh, developed. Uh, but anyway, you can generally trust a Gallup poll was the takeaway message from that. Uh, so these are the top fears of American adults. And for some reason, snakes snakes are at the top of the list. You know, not, maybe that's almost some kind of like uh, instinctual thing. I don't know. Uh, I don't think I'm necessarily uh, ter <laughs> terrified of snakes. But then again, <laughs> I think if I, look, if I look down and saw one crawling uh, towards me, I'd probably <laughs> stop the lecture. <laughs> uh, but public speaking, though, look at that. That's the... I guess this is the key thing here is that uh, the public speaking is second place and it's, you know, not all that far behind snakes. So that, that's kind of weird. I think I would much rather give a lecture 
uh, than have to jump into a snake pit. <laughs> <laughs> Lion Deanna Jones. <laughs> you know, I'll take the lecture option, please. Um, <clears throat> and I think they also in the book had that old quote from Seinfeld about how uh, most people at a funeral would rather be the person in the coffin than the one giving the, uh, the eulogy. So I guess you know, why are we even bringing this up? I guess to show you that if you do have a fear of public speaking, you're, you're certainly not alone. And especially when you factor in uh, sort of hostile uh, public speaking situations. Uh, one of the ones that comes to mind is a, big, a lot of people want to go into law or forensics, uh, something like this, and not realizing that part of that job will be public speaking. And, and not only will you be speaking in public, but you'll be cross-examined and people will be there trying to destroy your credibility, uh, maybe even humiliate you. And that can be just too much for some people to take. Uh, and a lot of, I'm sure there are a lot of people that would be fabulous teachers, you know, they know their content really well, they're great people, like they care about students, but uh, they just, they, they're so scared, nervous about uh, getting, getting up in front of a group and talking so that can, you know, not telling how many great teachers and politicians and, you know, run down the list of people that would have been great, but for this one thing, they were too afraid of the public speaking. So as we'll see, it's it's fine to be nervous, uh, but you don't want this, you know, be, to to overwhelm you and prevent you from reaching your goals. You know, if your goal is to become a teacher and you know you uh, struggle with the uh, fear of public speaking, you know, what can you do about it? And there's some general advice in here, but I would also add, uh, you can certainly go to uh, professional counseling uh, therapy. And it's great for this. You know, we still have this, I was talking to a therapist just the other day and we were talking about the, uh, uh, this, this stigma that's still around about just going, <laughs> getting help, <laughs> like mental health, mental health. Uh, people just have this hang up about it and they will not go uh, to get any kind of help with something like public speaking. Uh, they just try to live with this, uh, you know, can, can be debilitating uh, when they could easily just get some <laughs> counseling, get some exercises, get some training, learn some techniques, and really improve their quality of quality of life. So just wanted to put that out there. Uh, anyway, feeling some nerves can heighten your ability to deliver forcefully and passionately. You know, uh, <clears throat> well, let me take the second one here too. Nervousness is dysfunctional only when it impairs your ability to deliver your content. Yeah, these two things here, I, I sh couldn't agree with this stuff more. You know, again, one of the most challenging kind of students to work with is somebody who says, I have no fear. Or, I, I never get nervous <laughs> about speaking up and public speaking. Because usually what that translates into is a, a lack of respect or even cognizance of their audience. Right? They're sort of so self-absorbed. Uh, they're just unaware uh, of what other people think about them or how other people are responding to them. or They just genuinely don't care about that. Now, I don't think that's to me, that's probably an even worse problem than the person who uh, struggles with uh, nervousness. Because really what this comes down to, I think, is uh, you know a healthy respect for this audience. You know, you're not expecting them just to accept your message passively. <laughs> These aren't sheep. <laughs> uh, but instead, they're, they're human beings like you with their own minds. And they might agree or disagree or find something interesting or, or not interesting. And so I think it's a healthy thing to have. Uh, but again, this is right too, right? You don't want it to get to the point where it's impairing your ability uh, to deliver the content. So that it should be something that motivates you. You know, I like that song uh, by, as a survivor, the Eye of the Tiger, is that famous uh, song. I'm sure you've heard it. Uh, but one of the lines in there is, rising to the challenge of your rivals. <laughs> I, I think that's a great line to keep in mind for public speaking, right? You're rising to the challenge, right? You're, you're going to uh, stand up there and see if you can deliver this this content with some force and some passion and uh, win the day all right that should be the goal not being uh don't let the, ch the challenge scare you away uh, instead let it motivate you and here's some tips for overcoming fear <clears throat> and speaking with confidence uh, the first is to engage in relaxation techniques and again this is something i think I don't think any of these work for everybody. Right? I mean, you, you have to know yourself a little bit. Uh, you can try things out, 
you know, I give uh, each one of these two or three times. You know, see if it works. Uh, see if it helps. Uh, some of these work really well for some people, not so much for others. But, you know, find what, what works best for you is my advice. But engaging in the relaxation techniques, I think they talked about maybe a little walk, uh, just going and sitting somewhere quiet for a while. Now, that's all good. Uh, maybe drink some uh, tea or some strange, strangely to say, but coffee. You know, they say to watch your beverage intake here, but I always find uh, coffee is a great, even though it is caffeine, I get that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a stimulant, uh, but so, yet somehow, though, it kind of relaxes me, or at least decreases my nerves, you know, when I'm about to give a talk. So you might try that. I would not suggest alcohol. You know, some people, they, get, they, they say, I'm just so nervous, I got to do something. They do like a, a shot of whiskey or something. You know, I've seen that at conferences. I think that's a, a pretty terrible idea. Uh, I would never recommend that. Uh, yeah, breathing. <laughs> breathing would be a better idea. Uh, become aware of your breathing you know there's there's apps you can get on my uh my apple watch has a breathing app on it i use sometimes uh, but it's really just about focusing your attention on something else even for 30 seconds to a minute just thinking about nothing else but breathing and sort of if you use this breathing app breathing app it kind of forces you to focus on that uh, for a little while and that can you know, kind of like stretching a muscle in your body, right? It, it's kind of like stretching your mind a little bit uh, so that you can uncoil a little bit. Uh, practicing visualization. So you can, this is a useful one too. And oddly enough, this comes up in uh, martial arts training. <clears throat> uh, so one of the things you do in a martial arts class, or at least the one I was taking in here at St. Cloud State with uh, Mr. Knowles called uh, Tonk Sudo. Uh, but he was <laughs> one part of the uh, test to get your sh first strike was you had to break a board. Uh, so he would come out there with a board, hold it up, and you'd have to punch using the palm of your hand, punch through that uh, board. And of course, you would look at this and think, there's no way I, I can do that. And a lot of people would fail. You know, they'd hit the board, but it wouldn't break. And so finally, Mr. Knowles said, look, here's the secret. It's about visualization he didn't use this this terminology or maybe he did i don't remember <laughs> but he said instead of imagining yourself hitting the board uh, imagine your your uh, your fist going through the board and so see it just going right through that board and ending up somewhere behind the board you know really visualize that and we just did this you know for a few minutes just visualizing this over and over again and I mean, I was just stupefied by how well this worked. I mean, I was able to break that board, <laughs> something I never thought I would be able to do. <laughs> you know, I was one of the ones that failed, you know, just hitting the board. But this, this visualization was amazing. Uh, so it, even if it sounds a little, eh, eh, you know, just, just really try it. Uh, so they're talking, obviously, you wouldn't be imagining <laughs> breaking a board. <laughs> uh, but, you know, imagine yourself up giving that successful talk. Uh, having an engaged audience, you know, doing really well, you know, if you visualize that, that can do wonders for your, your confidence, actually to help you get the job done. A uh, next tip is focusing on friendly faces initially to gain composure and confidence, uh, right? <laughs> so you don't want to be focused on the person that looks bored, <laughs> staring at the phone or at the clock, you know, don't focus on them. Look around, see if you can find the person that looks like they, they really care. You know, they're looking, they're engaged. There's always at least one in every crowd, right? Uh, you know, sometimes I go into a classroom to teach and it seems like everybody's just kind of in the back. They're doing their own thing. They're not even, don't even seem to notice that I'm up there, right? And that can get very discouraging. You know, sometimes I just want to just walk out, say, screw you people. <laughs> uh, you obviously don't care and just leave. And of course, that would be a profound mistake because if you just look around a little bit more you will see well okay yeah sure there's those people but there's like you know what there's also people that, that are there because they want to be there uh, they want to learn the material they <laughs> for lack of a better words like me <laughs> uh, so you kind of look at them get, gain a little bit of that composure back confidence back and, and move on you know focus on the positives not the negatives you know my favorite example of that too is the and when people say that, you know, people in St. Cloud can't drive. Or they say something like this. And, of course, <laughs> they're basing that on, like, the, the two or three really negative experiences they have and not even noticing that, yeah, most of the people drive just fine. 
So why are you getting so fixated on the, yeah, the negative side? Uh, watching the food and beverage intake. And again, I have noticed people that drink a little too much coffee and basically have to uh, use the bathroom, uh, especially if you're on some of these panels sometimes. Sometimes you're the last speaker on a panel, right? And that panel might be 45 minutes or even over an hour. And you might just be sitting there with this pitcher of water in front of you or your super large grande coffee, <laughs> whatever it is, drinking this. And pretty soon, you know, you have to go to the bathroom. Uh, usually I don't have a problem if I just run out and come back in. But it is something to consider. If that's not an option for you, you certainly wouldn't want to drink a lot of, uh, you know, liquid. <clears throat> now, get comfortable with the audience members before starting the presentation. That's another golden tip you know, it certainly worked extremely well for me and just going around even at these if you have a conference presentation showing up there just going around before your talk and say hi uh you know i'm matt i'm matt barton i'm the speaker one of the speakers today you know happy to see you where are you from <laughs> you know just a little bit of chit chat like that uh, really breaks the ice it'll help you with some of these uh, other tips as well uh, so really focusing on the audience you know, and by the way, that does contradict that musician I was talking to you about earlier. Uh, his advice was don't mingle with the audience, right? The, he always said that one of the biggest mistakes bands make is they, uh, they they have some drinks or something with just, you know, the, the bar crowd, I suppose. Uh, so his advice was don't let anybody see you until you're actually there performing the song, uh, your first song, right? And then, and then leave immediately afterward because he was all about maintaining that basically a sense of alien alienation from the audience right you're not one of them you know, you're something special <laughs> so, so maybe that would work for the rock star uh, but if you're just there to present and you want to have this different kind of relationship it's probably better for you <laughs> uh, to try to get to know the people and certainly uh, you know i see plenty of bands that would do this and they would hang out after the set and talk to people and that really seemed to build up a community and so i guess maybe it depends too on what kind of uh what kind of fans are you are you looking for fans or are you looking for friends you know i guess that's the key thing uh focusing on the people <laughs> so make people the subject of your sentences and that's that's a good uh point to make remember you're talking to people <laughs> uh you need to try to connect your message to at all times uh, introducing colleagues and referring to them by name during your presentation uh, this is a good way to and if, if you don't know what this is like just look at any sort of uh, political speech you'll see that usually the speakers the first thing they'll do is uh, talk about these other people in the audience the people that helped them to get there the local officials right maybe introduce them you know have a, a stand up Rodney <laughs> a stand up uh, Amy you know <laughs> and so and so did such a great job uh, and that kind of connects people and then using the names of audience members as appropriate I almost think of this one as kind of a terror tactic uh, you know, people think that you might call on them or might mention them. Uh, that's <laughs> they tend to be a little bit more, um, uh, what's the word, uh, self-conscious, I suppose. Uh, so they, they know they can't just kind of do that disappearing routine and just kind of uh, settle back and <laughs> kind of get dis kind of get disengaged, just uh, you know, disappear on you, even though they're right there. If you know that suddenly uh, your name might come up. And, you know, I had plenty of professors that <laughs> say, well, I was, you know, talking to Matt just the other day. And the kind of the way they say Matt kind of, oh, oh, what, what, <laughs> what I miss? I'm paying attention. <laughs> yeah, it's that kind of number. I don't think that's quite what they're talking about here. But uh, yeah, if you can connect it to the audience there, that will certainly make people, uh, uh, it makes it easier to pay attention, I think. People like to be included. I remember a couple of times I wrote in, I like to listen to podcasts, and a couple of times I've written in emails to podcasters and, and just kind of a, for fun, basically. Uh, but I remember a couple of times where they would mention that some one of them even read my uh, email on their show. It was a show about a history according to Bob. <laughs> he read this. And I just was so honored by that. Uh, it really made my day uh, to be on that night. It really made me like the, the show a lot more. Okay, let's see. Uh, make people the subject of your sentences. Here's some examples. Uh, so this is a this is the typical, they call it less effective, I would just call it typical, uh, to say something like this. 
The survey showed just 43% of respondents believe that annual reviews are accurate indicators of performance. So here the focus is on the survey, right? We're just saying respondents. It's, you know, you got a statistic there, but it's kind of dry, right? It's, it's not, it doesn't seem to resonate. Now compare that to the second example. Jeff, Steve, and I, Jeff, Steve, and I developed the survey after holding focus groups with our blah, blah, blah. Uh, so the key difference there is this introduction of the people involved. You see, we're not just talking here about data. Uh, we're also including the, some basically the characters in the story. So again, kind of back to this idea of we're telling a story. Here's here's our characters, Jeff, Steve, and I. <laughs> These are the heroes. <laughs> and so you show them, say their names, you know, people look at them, see who they are, and that will uh, add to the message. And so let's see, introducing colleagues by name. Uh, 15.2. So again, the typical example would be to say something like, I'll be presenting research conducted by the HRT. That's, so yeah, the statement is good. I guess you, at least you mentioned the HR team, uh, but you probably should have mentioned them by name. Uh, so our HR team, including Jeff Brody and Steve Choi, spent the last two months. So you see the idea there. And if you've ever been on the other other end of one of these, you know what, you know how powerful this can be. If I just said, you can imagine me if I just said, uh, you know, I'm really happy uh, with the proposals I've been reading in, from my students this semester. And if I just left it there, uh, versus if I said, you know, for example, uh, and then mentioned your name and your proposal, <laughs> that would, would really uh, do a lot for you. That'd have that strong, uh, that strong effect. Uh, rather than just being lumped in with everybody else. Of course, you, you know, realistically, you can't thank everybody. I'm always comparing this to that line you get in books where they say uh, something like acknowledgments. Now, I'd like to acknowledge the following people. And there's this list, and then somewhere after all this list of names, there's this, uh, and everybody else. <laughs> and all the other people. Uh, that I just don't have the space to mention or something like that. And you think, wow, those people are probably just so honored. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm glad you helped, but, you know, you didn't help enough. Okay, I'm being a little bit facetious there, but, but you get the idea. And really, some of the most effective leaders I've seen, I mean, you can say what you want to about politicians, but, uh, you know, they, they, I think this is one of the ways they get people to uh, be loyal to them. Is that they, they always do this no matter how long it takes you know they might spend 15 20 minutes just going through this massive list of names of people and you think i don't know them i don't really care about i don't need to hear the all names of 15 people that were on this hr team uh, what difference does that make to me well probably not but to them you know it makes but i think it can, it can make a really big difference uh, so here we're talking about using the names of the audience members and we talked a little bit about this already. Uh, you might know some people in the audience from previous talks or just somebody that you know, happen to know a friend of yours. Uh, or it could be somebody you met there. Again, if you showed up early, mingled a little bit, uh, learned a little bit about them so you can refer to them when, it, when the time is right. Uh, it just kind of provides a more uh, cordial vibe, I think, to some of these things. Yeah, so this first one they call, they say it's a faceless comment. So think about that word faceless as we look at this example. Uh, it's common for managers to continue conducting annual performance reviews, even though they think there should be better ways of evaluating and motivating performance. So we, we don't have uh, any real people, quote unquote, in that excerpt. Now let's look at the other example. Just before we started the meeting this morning, Cynthia, John, and I we're chatting about annual performance reviews, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so again, we got uh, people in their relatable manner. Uh, and again, as a teacher, you might refer to, you're always having these little side conversations before or after class, or <laughs> sometimes in the midst of class, you know, with students. And, uh, you know, I guess it's a little tricky in this, this particular climate sometimes, but you know, if, to the extent that you can work them into the material, um, and that can be really a positive thing. You know, like that podcast example I was uh, telling you about earlier. Uh, staying flexible. Uh, arriving early. <laughs> that's, all, that's just, you know, I don't think you should ever be fashionably late uh, to a talk you're giving. That 
I know a lot of uh, the big shots like to do this. You know, I'm not going to name any names, but uh, it seems like some of the big celebrities, especially politicians, they almost make a virtue of this. Like they want to keep you waiting, <laughs> you know, waiting that extra hour or whatever it is. Uh, so that might work for them, but you know, for the purposes of, for our purposes, of just as just humble business people, you know, we want to show up early and respect people's time. Uh, yeah, focusing on the needs of that audience, you know, whatever that is, uh, maybe they need uh, well, lots of visual aids, for example. Uh, maybe they need you to define all these terms. Uh, you don't want to just have that same, <coughs> you don't want to fall into the trap of just having that same exact presentation every time without being able to adjust it uh, as, uh, as you need to. Uh, when you lose your place, don't panic. You, know, well, you should never panic, uh, but it, it's going to happen. Uh, you're going to be up there sometimes and you just forget, like, what was I saying? And maybe somebody asked a question or there's an interruption of some sort. Then you're trying to figure out, where was I? And you can have that little moment of uh, <laughs> existential anxiety. <laughs> like, wh who am I? Is, is, am I in the real world? <laughs> or is this just a fantasy? <laughs> you can have that kind of level of, like, weirdness sometimes. Uh, but, the, you know, the key is just, it's okay. It's It probably seems like forever to you, but... It's probably just a few set People probably don't even notice. You know, I kind of keep coming back to this musician example, but, you know, it's, it was often pointed out to me that, you know, for the band, you know, for the performer, if you mess up, you think, oh, God, this is terrible. You know, the song is ruined. Uh, when in reality, most people don't notice. And even if they notice, they quickly forget, forgot about it. Uh, maybe they don't even realize that you made a mistake. You know, uh, uh, singers flub the lines all the time. In live performances, it's no big deal. Uh, so usually, it, it makes it's a, it's a lot bigger in your mind uh, than it is in anybody else's. So that's another thing that might comfort you a little bit, I suppose. Uh, my favorite example of this is kind of a horrible example. I'll never forget it though. Just it just really made that deep an impression on me. I was I was at a Three C's or Four C's conference, which is the big composition and rhetoric conference big international international thing uh, and, and it's kind of a big deal when you get accepted to it and i got to be about a 50 50 hit or miss <laughs> about half the times i get rejected uh but i have presented there before uh, but anyway i went to this uh panel and there was a speaker there that it was his first time and he had these uh this was long ago <laughs> kind of dating myself here i suppose <laughs> uh but the guy had these uh, transparency sheets like you use for those overhead projectors, if you even know what, what that is, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, he was that was his, instead of PowerPoint, he was just gonna put these uh, transparencies on the projector and as his visual aids, right? And he had a big stack of them. And he was very nervous, he was shaking. And it, it was so bad that when he was, he tried to go up and put his uh, transparency on there, uh, he just flipped out and it, you know, they, they kind of fell out and they went all over the place. <laughs> these transparency sheets <laughs> and he didn't number them and another big mistake you should always have these things numbered um <clears throat> so he's like oh my god i just can't do this <laughs> he goes running out running out of the room and you know all the audience is like god it's okay i mean it was just like the most compassionate thing uh, everybody was nobody there was critical of this man you know everybody was just it's totally cool. Like, we'll help you uh, sort through your transparencies or maybe let the other speaker go and you can, you know, organize, uh, you know, as that person is speaking. <laughs> but but he didn't do that. He panicked. I don't know what happened to him. I guess he fl fled the building. <laughs> never, never saw him again. Uh, so that story didn't end well. So maybe it wasn't the best example. Uh, but don't let that be you. Uh, just remember, it's the other people there, they probably care you know, nobody wants you to fail. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> like that audience, we would have been perfectly fine uh, for him to take a few minutes to sort through his stuff and, and give his talk. Nobody was going to judge him on that. <clears throat> All right, let's see, moving on. Uh, never tell your audience things haven't gone as expected. Yeah, this is this is a big one. Like, why do you want to tell things, say things that are gonna make you look bad uh, that you don't have to and that people probably don't care about? It's kind of like the, the band. It'd be like a band coming out and saying, you know, uh, here's the thing, you know, and <laughs> I missed, messed up this little, uh, these notes, got the wrong notes here. I said this lyric wrong. 
uh, on that song and uh, you know my pedal was fussy on my guitar <laughs> Uh, and what who cares right I mean why are you even bringing this stuff up people probably didn't even notice uh, I remember I just saw a presentation and they were having some issues with the uh, the mics uh, so I don't know what the heck was going on but uh, the microphone just seemed like it was cutting off and on and it was making these loud like explosive sounds occasionally uh, and they kept on saying every time it happened they would stop and say you know this this shouldn't be like this and this it didn't go like this during the rehearsal and we're sorry about this uh, mic situation and it was pretty bad but you know, I don't think they made things any better by just keep keep bringing it back to our attention again and again you know they should have just maybe once said oh sorry about that noise and just kind of moved on uh, but by bringing it back to our attention again and again they kind of kept our focus on that which wasn't a very good uh, good strategy let's see always have a plan b yes this is another piece of advice that will save your bacon uh whenever if it's a high stakes presentation i don't just uh have my presentation in one place <laughs> you know i have a have it on a thumb drive i have it saved in google drive uh, i have a have it on my laptop make sure that it's on the laptop uh, you know three or four ways and sometimes I've even gone so far as to print the thing out in the book I think that's good advice the book says repeats that it's a little uh, story from a CEO there uh, so he always just has a printout you can go to PowerPoint and just print your slides with your notes and so if all else fails and you've got no nothing is working you know you got this plan B that uh, you can fall back on but you know I've actually run the some of these major conferences I have been the uh, I volunteered to be the tech one of the tech supports <laughs> so running around trying to help people get their powerpoints or whatever apple what was that apple thing called uh keynote <laughs> their keynotes or laptops and it's just so many things that can go wrong and even you know even uh, with the training and everything for that and being somewhat of being somewhat computer savvy uh, there were plenty of situations that i didn't know how like how, how do you get an ipad <laughs> connected to this projector you know you didn't bring any cables with you <laughs> I, you know I don't, I don't know and then they some people didn't have this plan b so they were just like well what do i do just not give my talk well they should have had you know maybe that would have been a good example where having uh, some handouts might have been a good fallback plan or a printout and so you know what your key messages are and we talked about this too in, in terms of having a theme or a focus for the presentation remember you, you want to be able to say this is what the presentation is about we're talking about a b and c you know these are my takeaways and uh you know like here the take like stay flexible that's kind of the key message of this all this presentation right now so if you don't have those and you're just kind of all over the place uh, that's not a good sign all right using the room uh, to your advantage uh, this is another yet another good reason talking about a, a key themes of showing up early you know if i teach in a classroom if i haven't taught in that classroom before then if it's at all possible i will go there early maybe the day or two before just kind of walk around pace the room a little bit get a feel for the you know turn on the computer if there's a computer in there figure out how all that works uh, but also just kind of figuring out the dynamics of that room you know where's where's it going to be where are the chairs going to be where will it be hard to hear where can I <laughs> walk safely where are there obstacles <laughs> uh, yeah position yourself where people can see you you know where should you uh, sometimes this is determined for you right but uh, sometimes you can you know adjust some of these things a little bit uh, uh, so yeah knowing the layout of the room is is critical plus it's kind of comforting too there's a familiarity you know, this is the reason why a lot of teachers uh, like to teach in the same classroom over and over again it's because even if the students are new at least they're familiar with the classroom and the room itself right so they have a little bit of context <laughs> if you will uh, to comfort them <clears throat> so uh, people need to be able to see you easily that's that's critical uh, don't hide behind the uh, the podium <laughs> use podiums and tables strategically uh, I know I you know I criticize some people sometimes for this uh you know again so I go to some panels sometimes and everybody's just sitting down giving their giving their presentation I don't like that I just think it kind of projects doesn't project energy very well 
Uh, some people can do it, and some people have to do it. You know, they, they had no other choice, and that's, of course, a, a different situation. But uh, I like to think uh, whatever you can do to project some energy is usually better uh, uh, than hunkering down. Uh, one of my friends and <laughs> my friendly, one of my best and favorite colleagues, Sharon Cognell, <laughs> uh, she's got some funny, she's always uh, very humorous about this issue with the podiums and the tables and uh, wanting people to be able to see her because um, the way they position some of these teacher workstations, it's like, you know, you can see like the top of her head <laughs> over the, the, the screen. It's kind of, a, it's, it's, she, she makes a joke out of it, but I mean, it is kind of a serious issue, uh, but she's very aware of that uh, need. Uh, let's see, moving around, but avoiding distracting the audience. Yes, so it's good to not just stand rooted in the, in the same spot. You know, uh, you know, maybe the projectors here in the middle, usually maybe the workstation over here. Uh, so you might spend some time there working with the tech, but you probably want to be more like here, maybe cross over there occasionally. Now, I have seen people, you know, let's say these are the, the rows, you know, they'll get down like in here somewhere, just like walking. <laughs> I don't know what, what the, the plan is. They're kind of moving around all around the room. It's a little bit easier when you got a circular arrangement. You can do something like this. But uh, Some of the teachers tell me they do this because, you know, if they see some people over here kind of getting off task, you know, they'll, they'll walk over and stand next to them to make them a little bit more uh, self-conscious, I suppose. It's, it's kind of a strategy. But, you know, some people, are, you know, you don't want to be pacing back and forth like you're on, uh, <laughs> like pacing. Uh, that doesn't look too uh, uh, too good. And so I don't know what really what the best. Let's see, do they give us any really good advice here? Position yourself close, close so you can establish eye contact. Yeah, that's good. Walk around the room. Have your vantage points various audience members will have. <clears throat> you know, I'm just thinking in terms of teaching. One of the problems I struggle with is when I have you know, the situation with the, the rows. And I really hate it when students come in and they, they sit in the very back and you got like <laughs> nobody, you got like a huge gulf of empty rows between you and the, and the audience. And usually in those situations, I'll just say, look, come on guys, <laughs> move up. Uh, I'm not gonna, this is ridiculous. You know, get, if there's an empty seat in front of you, take it uh, so I don't have to, to do this. But I guess another strategy could be just to, to stand like in the midst of these rows so they can't really pull that uh, maneuver. You know, and I get it. They're just trying to get into a comfort zone back there. Uh, nobody wants to be the the center of attention if they don't really know what to expect. You know, there's some kind of issues around that. And so anyway, my problem is I want people to be comfortable, but on the other hand, I don't want to, uh, I don't want them to be so comfortable that they fall asleep or feel like they don't need to pay attention at all. Uh, so anyway, I'd like to hear what you, what your thoughts are on that issue. Uh, but I certainly seen I've seen the teachers like me that'll say just move up. Uh, but you know maybe if you're giving a sales presentation or this, these people are managers, you know you might not be comfortable doing that. So you might have to resort to this moving moving strategy, getting closer to them. Let's see, communicating non-verbally with the soften model. It's a wonderful acronym because it soften kind of brings to mind, uh, it kind of provides a theme, I suppose, for what it is they're talking about. And so it's, it's good to have in mind, soften. <laughs> Maybe just overall soften your nonverbal communication. You think, what would that mean to soften it? Well, you know, smile. <laughs> Although I have heard, had plenty of teachers tell me, you should never smile at, smile at your students. No smiles until after midterm. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've heard quite a few teachers say that uh, again because you don't want these students to be too comfortable. Uh, sometimes that can impede, uh, somehow impact your credibility. I don't know. I, I guess I'm kind of a smiley guy. It'd be hard for me not to smile. <laughs> uh, but anyway, smile. Uh, open stance, uh, so as opposed to having your arms crossed or again hunkered down behind that podium. You know, to be kind of open. Uh, there's a if you ever watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, <laughs> Larry David, uh, he's kind of the, the master of really, it kind of strikes me just how he's always got this very open stance. You know, have his, uh, his arms out in front of him, kind of spread out with his palms up when he's talking to somebody. And some of the other people on the show do that as well. It's kind of, 
Yeah, I, I wonder what <laughs> first time a couple times I saw that I was like, what is he doing? What is up with this stance? Uh, but it was kind of this, this open stance. It's uh, hey, you know, <laughs> friendly, accessible, uh, listening, open-minded. You know, it kind of conveys a lot of uh, emotions and attitudes. So it might be worth trying. Uh, the forward lean, <laughs> you know, as opposed to the leaning back. You know, think about a you you want to be leaned in towards somebody like you're really listening to them. Not in a creepy way. <laughs> I guess that's what, you know all of this stuff. We watched the uh, that hilarious scene with Dwight where he was exaggerating all these things and got ridiculous. So don't, so don't do that. Yeah, softening the tone. You know, people don't usually like to be uh, like a scolding tone. Uh, the eye contact. Again, this is something that can be overdone. You know, I like to look around, see if I can make eye contact with people and not just sit there and stare at somebody for minutes. <laughs> you know, but, yeah, but you can look around and <clears throat> if people know, if you make, if you ever been to a big talk and the, the speaker makes eye contact with you, you can feel a little special. You know, I was kind of thrilled one time I was at a, a Judas Priest concert and uh, this friend of mine, I, I won't go into all the details, but somehow he got uh somebody there was people there with balloons holding up these giant balloons and he uh approached one and was i guess just chatting with this person and the person said let me ask you something uh are you a true judas priest fan this friend of mine named chris you know because <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> so he says oh prove it uh list uh three judas priest albums and so chris is like boom 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 and the guy says, oh, good job. So here's some some special passes for you and your, your friend or you and your you know partner or whatever. Uh, so as he was there with his wife. His wife didn't care about the Judas Priest. He knew I was kind of crazy about him. Uh, so we got right, like right up front, like literally right in front of the stage. And it was awesome. <laughs> uh, but I mean, we were close enough that we kind of made eye contact a few times with, with the band. And that was just for me, just incredible. You know, very different experience than being way in the back, you know, like most concerts where, you know, you're just one of <laughs> an endless sea of faces. Uh, so that is pretty cool. You know, I don't know if you feel like that when you're in a classroom. <laughs> a classroom. <laughs> Your professor makes eye contact with you. But, but you know, it does kind of draw you in. You really feel like, uh, you know, you're there. There's a presence uh, with eye contact that you don't get uh, otherwise. And, you know, simply nodding. You know, nodding in agreement, uh, that, you know, tends to work well. And you look at any, uh, you know, any communicators on television, uh, talk show hosts, whatever it is, panels, you usually see them nodding. You know, even if they're not talking at the time, they're kind of nodding. That's a form of communication, right? They're showing agreement. All right, last, uh, well, not last, lastly, but <laughs> getting there. Uh, dressing for success. Uh, formal business dress, and I got some pictures I added to this presentation because I think you need pictures. Uh, but anyway, the formal business dress intended to project executive presence and seriousness, and the business casual project a more comfortable, relaxed feel which, while still maintaining a high standard of professionalism. And then casual dress, the least formal option and rare in a business-related setting. So I got some pictures here we can look at. That I think make this a little bit uh, more tangible. You know, I, I find I, I tend to do better if I dress a little bit more formally uh, than I, I would ordinarily. <clears throat> like when I give these presentations, <clears throat> I'm sure you notice in this class I like to put on my suit. I just not only feel like it kind of fits better with the theme of, of the course, but you know, it seems to have some impact on my confidence level. You know, it's kind of hard to feel really professional and talk about professionalism <laughs> if, I, if I was dressed in shorts or something. I just wouldn't uh, uh, feel right, even though you can't see me unless I turn the camera on. Uh, so it's something to think about, uh, no matter what the situation is. And, you know, just one other thing I'll say about this I found from it's my personal anecdote. If you ever have to travel <laughs> on airlines, which is one of my least favorite things to do, I hate it. But I found that if you wear a suit and tie, even though this might just be going on vacation, uh, but somehow, just try it. If you don't believe me, dress really formally next time you fly, and you'll be treated entirely different. You know, it just seems like everything goes smoother. 
you know, not necessarily once you're on the plane and you're seated in the, in the cheap seats, but you know, everything up to that point, you know, it's all, uh, for me, it's all sir, sir, this, and sir, that, and, <laughs> you know, you really seem to get a lot more respect uh, from the, uh, you know, the officials there and everything. So just try that out and, and see what it's like. All right, casual. So this is what casual looks like uh, for men. Remember, this is what they say you should not do <laughs> in most uh, business situations. And I'd probably say teaching as well. You know, this is, you can be a little too casual. Notice these are supposed to be jeans, uh, not a leather watch, okay, <laughs> collared shirts. So it's not all the way down to like, you know, t-shirts and shorts, but it's still not really considered uh, business appropriate. And for women there, sundresses, uh, also fitted blouse or collared, uh, collared, collared, <laughs> collared shirts, skirts or dark jeans, flat shoes. Uh, where found casual Fridays. So sometimes you work in a business office and they'll have what they call casual Fridays. And you probably know what that is. But uh, the general advice is even on that casual Friday, uh, you don't want to be the least casually dressed. So not ever really casual. Yeah, notes casual dress requires grooming and effort. <laughs> Most headwear is unacceptable indoors, right? So you probably wouldn't wear, wear it being wearing a ball cap for a guy. Let's see, uh, business casual, typically the minimum dress code throughout established or old school businesses. So this is the minimum dress code. It's a minimum. <laughs> uh, the blazer, sports coats, or sweater. So I don't really, I'm trying to think about other professors, and I know most of them probably go, I'm probably on that casual side of the spectrum. Um, it seems like most of my colleagues will have a vest or a blazer. Uh, sweaters are very popular, especially being in Minnesota. <laughs> I remember Noam Chomsky was wearing this really nice sweater. I was thinking, man, I want to get a sweater like that. <laughs> it just looks so professorial, you know. And of course, this doesn't have the elbow patches. But anyway, I'm being silly. Uh, dress your pants, leather shoes. Uh, women, uh, fitted blouse, button-down shirts, knee-length skirt, uh, flats, sling backs, or boots. Uh, watch simple jewelry right so yeah department managers you might see this entry-level employees you know so this is probably the the uh, default nowadays wouldn't wouldn't you say and then the business formal which is all the way at the top and there are plenty of businesses like this i mean i remember working as a temp agent <laughs> it was you know for these law firms and they'd want me to wear like business formal clothing uh, even though i'm basically just uh you know being a gopher for that day you know, they say you should always have at least a couple of, even no matter what your career lifestyle is, you probably want a couple of formal options in your wardrobe. <laughs> and this is a funny thing. I've talked to a lot of students on a budget, including myself. And this is the shocker is that it's usually cheaper to dress business formal than it is any of these other options. I, I kid you not. Uh, if you go to a place like TJ Maxx or Ross, um, <clears throat> Burlington Coat Factory, you know, any of these places you can, you can, it's not going to be the latest fashions, <laughs> uh, but uh, really the, the nice thing about business formal is it really doesn't change all that much uh, over the years, right? So if you had a, you know, like the, the shirt here it could be a shirt from 10, 15 years ago. It's the same, <laughs> same shirt. <laughs> it's fine. It doesn't really change. Uh, so you can find like a, I remember going to Ross, which is basically like TJ Maxx in Tampa, and I was on a severe budget. I mean, it's ludicrous. Uh, being, being, being able to find uh, shirts and tie sets for just uh, like five bucks, you know, brand new, uh, straight out of the package. Uh, now you might have spent a little bit more on the on the jacket uh, or the suit, but even though sometimes, you know, especially if you go second hand, you know, just a little bit of nothing. A lot cheaper, uh, ex exponentially cheaper uh, than a set of uh, designer jeans and, you know, nice, um, uh, tennis shoes <laughs> you know people spend 200 bucks on a pair of uh, athletic shoes these days or jeans you know you can get this uh, formal look for a lot cheaper so anyway i just put that out there uh so it's not always a question of having the you know most expensive tailor-made suit so anyway fitted solid solid colors or pinstripe suits <laughs> pinstripe okay <laughs> uh solid color collared button down with cuff sleeves uh 
solid color simple pattern necktie shoes <laughs> the folded pocket square okay that might be a little much uh, I, th I think it's funny the suits that have this little fake pocket square but <laughs> getting way off topic <laughs> I, I don't know i just don't you find this kind of interesting though uh cuff links yeah i don't have any suits with uh cuff links i guess maybe tuck rented tuxedos yeah don't forget too you can rent this stuff too if you if you know you're never going to wear it except for say a job interview and you might want to just look into renting it or borrowing it let's see women fitted solid color suits uh, solid color simple pattern blouses or button downs stockings lower high heels and simple jewelry all right so anyway <laughs> oh unacceptable left off <laughs> this is typically how i dress <laughs> nah but again you, you kind of wonder you see these things about all oh, the american students are doing so poorly compared to students in other countries and you know why is that they always blame the well, the poor old teachers get all the blame well if we just had better teachers you know, that's, not, that's like their go-to for everything uh when really I, you can look at something like well, what are the students wearing you know are they dressing like this you know i, I look at students are on our campus sometimes and they're like in pajamas or just you know it really less like maybe that'd be questionable even if they were going to a gym you know much less in a, a, a serious class i mean how can you be uh you know expect to be taken seriously if you look like you know <laughs> this gentleman <laughs> you know what is this a stain is that a a hole i don't know what i'm looking at there it looks like a looks like a stain <laughs> you know this is just not really beyond whether it's acceptable dress code whatever just you know how does this make you feel to be sitting in a classroom dressed like this does it contribute to that uh feeling of seriousness of, of confidence now sometimes people say this is just i'm more comfortable like this and that's what really matters uh, but again, you know, they said you could be too comfortable, <laughs> right? You don't necessarily want to be totally comfortable, uh, you know, in a classroom. You're, you're there trying to learn something, develop a skill, uh, be thinking about your identity that you're developing, your professionalism, you know. So even a, even in the classroom, I, you know, I just don't know about some of this stuff. Open-toed or sockless shoes, sleeveless shirts. <laughs> Yeah, stains and holes. <laughs> Anything with holes. <laughs> of course, you might say, well, your priorities are, are messed up, Martin. You know, this is, uh, it's far more important to me that I uh, am authentic and I dress exactly like this, you know. <laughs> Who is it? Iggy, Iggy Pop that's always, uh, like, he refuses to wear a shirt. Anywhere he goes, he's got to go shirtless. He goes, I mean, that's who he is. <laughs> okay, if you're Iggy Pop, maybe you can get away with it, but... Uh, yeah i'd feel a little bit weird if i had a you know as open-minded as, as i try to be i'd be a little bit weirded out by a, a students without <laughs> shirts on <laughs> coming to class and i mean i could tell you some stories i have heard uh, but i won't get into that okay messages sent by formality yeah, this is a good good thing messages sent by what you're wearing right the characteristics people associate with those levels of formality uh, so if you are in the formal business clothing they think you're authoritative authoritative is my uh, grandpa would say you look like a boss <laughs> so you know, people kind of shape up a little bit when you're when you're around and dressed in a suit uh, they think this is somebody important and i should probably uh <laughs> you know, perk up a little bit you kind of have that effect uh competence oh this is a continuum right so we're going on down the list yeah all the way down to like creative and friendly so if you are the you know the person with the the stains the stained up shirt of the holes <laughs> you may have to think this is a very creative person this is a very friendly person you know i've had professors that i remember one of the professors i used to have and everybody seems to have a story like this but you know he he was always wearing the shorts just a plain white t-shirt i think probably sometimes it did have stains on it uh messed up hair <laughs> sandals and just did not look anything like you know the stereotypical professor you know i, I don't know if this <laughs> you know i would say the person looked a little too uh casual but you know everybody liked this these folks you know they're, they're very friendly very accessible uh just somehow seemed to work uh for them and i don't know if i could pull it off you know maybe that's my problem maybe i should just start wearing uh, <laughs> stained up clothes and and shorts and, and see how that goes 
Uh, uh, don't hold your breath waiting for that. All right, using visuals without <laughs> losing focus on you. This is uh, another thing I like to uh, to harp on with people because there's, there's all this temptation to let the presentation, uh, the slideshow, substitute for you when, again, people can look at this PowerPoint on their own time, right? The, the, the reason they're tuned in, the reason they're sitting there is because they want to see a person. You know, it's like a, the difference between a face-to-face -face class and a online class. You know, you need to provide, I like to think of uh, providing some value for that face-to-face. -face. You know, these people, they, they can't had to come here, uh, you know, set aside this time. Um, and they're doing all this because they want to see you, <laughs> a person, <laughs> uh, not the uh, not stare at the book or the screen. Even in an online class, though, you I, I think a lot of you probably like the fact that I uh, talk through these lectures instead of just typing up my notes for you to read, because uh, you could do that. Uh, without a person, really. But anyway, you're, you're up there, you're giving your talk, you're delivering this. Here's some general tips. Uh, so they talk about avoid turning out the lights. All right, because when they, those go off, people feel more comfortable sleeping. And plus, too, uh, you know, nowadays you really can't avoid the obsessive uh, uh, mobile phone users. And uh, if it's in a dark room, like a theater, and they, they're looking at their phone, that light's very distracting. It's usually not that distracting if there's a good bit of a ambient light in the room. And as much as I like to say, just, <laughs> you know, I wish nobody would do that. Uh, you know, people are people. Uh, don't start the slides right away. Right, it's good to, again, to kind of mingle a little bit, talk a little bit about the presentation. It's kind of warm up the audience a little bit, right? Uh, speak to your audience, not the screen. You know, back in the day, we'd say, don't teach to the board. You know, some teachers have the back to you they're back to you the whole time and they're just kind of focusing on this chalkboard or that nowadays a PowerPoint, right? When they should be, you know, facing you. And there's all kinds of apps you can get. <laughs> uh, I used to use these. I should probably use these again, but uh, there's apps you can get for your phone um, or your device where you can see what's up on the projector. Uh, so you can kind of be looking at that down in your, you know, at your hand instead of having to keep looking back at the, at the you know, at the, at the screen, but hopefully you know the presentation well enough where you don't have to keep doing that anyway. Uh, interpret, don't read your slides. Yeah, so I've kind of been guilty of this <laughs> from time to time. Uh, but yeah, you don't, you want to be providing some context there. Again, they can read the slides without you. What, what's your value? What, what are you adding to that? Uh, preview the slides before showing them. Now, a couple other tips. Use a remote control to advance the slides when possible. So, again, the, these apps I was telling you about, they can do this for you. It's a little bit technical, but if, it's not really hard to figure this out. Uh, you just go to the App Store on your phone and look for PowerPoint. You can look at this app and see what's required for it. Uh, there, there's diff Depending on the setup you've got, you might have a little USB thing you need to get or some kind of a connection, but it's, it's fairly easy to do. Or you can buy a dedicated device. You know, I see them on Amazon occasionally. They have a little uh, thumb pad, thumb stick kind of thing to control the uh, the pointer and then some buttons to move it forward and back. And, and you know, those, those are down to like 10 bucks. I think you can get it maybe even cheaper, especially if you go secondhand with one. It doesn't need to be fancy. Uh, the only thing I would look at is see, make sure the range is suitable. You know, sometimes if you're a long ways from the computer, you might not have a you know, enough range, kind of like just a remote control for a TV, right? You might have to be closer. Uh, so look into that, see what the range is. Uh, avoid standing in front of the slide projection. That makes you look crazy when you're up there and the, you got the projection on to you and people like reading words <laughs> on your face. <laughs> Especially if you, have a, if you have a big forehead like mine, you know, they can pretty much read the slide just based on the reflection off my forehead. Probably not the look I'm going for, you know. Uh, Using blank slides strategically. I don't know about a blank slide, but if you push B, or there's a button on these remotes to do this as well, you could mute the presentation, just show a, a black screen basically. And that's good from time to time. If you know, if you if, if, if what you're talking about has nothing to do with the slide, uh, just hit the button, blank it off. Blank it off, because otherwise people keep looking at it anyway. Uh, handouts. Uh, so you definitely want to use handouts in certain situations, uh, sometimes they're unnecessary <laughs> waste paper, uh, sometimes they're critical. Again, this just depends on the situation. Uh, they say generally you use it when you have detailed information. If you have 
bigger graphs, tables, you know, things that wouldn't show up well on the screen. Perfect example, good place to use a handout. If you can, wait until the end of the presentation to distribute the handouts. <laughs> That's good, because uh, otherwise, again, they will, uh, you know, just be looking at the handout the whole time instead of you. Now, I have seen that some exceptions to this. Uh, sometimes uh, I've seen professors or speakers they'll print out their PowerPoint again with those notes. Uh, but for the ones that get to the audience, the notes are blank. You know, and the idea there is that the audience can write their notes in, uh, you know, as they go, as you're going through the PowerPoint. I think that's that's pretty nice. <laughs> it's kind of expensive <laughs> uh, if you're the one paying for these copies, but you know, it could be could be a way to do that. You know, sometimes too, if you do have handouts, you can say things like, please refer to your handout now, table 12, as a way to get people's attention. You know, especially people have kind of been nodding off and the energy level is waning. <laughs> you know, shifting attention to the handout can be a, a nice change. All right, interacting with the audience. Uh, so some audiences, they can't wait to interact. Uh, sometimes people dread it. I, I've heard people tell me that they never, ever, ever would go to see a stand-up comic. I say, what are you talking about? I and mean, it's, it's, it's a great time. They say, oh no, <clears throat> you know, they just know I would be the one that this comic would single out in the audience and be uh, making fun of me and, and using me as the as a punchline of their jokes. <laughs> so kind, kind of the fear of having to interact with that comedian keeps them from having a good time, <laughs> at least in my opinion. I mean, I'd be kind of uh, flattered, I think. Uh, but then again, I've never been abused. I wouldn't go to a comic that I thought was going to abuse the audience, so. Uh, your mileage may vary. I guess sometimes you don't know what to expect. Uh, but anyway, in a business scenario, you got some uh, some times when basically you'll have to interact, or you, you should. Uh, the most obvious one is the fielding the questions. So sometimes you don't want questions during the presentation. You could say, have the introduce uh, whoever introduces you, or you could just say, please hold your questions, write them down. I'll, <laughs> we'll have a session at the end. Uh, or depending on the format, you might say, ask questions at any time you know, whatever the setup is. Uh, typically in a conference, there's set times. You, you've only got that 10 minutes to give your presentation. So the, probably the last thing you want is people keep interrupting you with questions. Uh, so in those situations, you'd probably say, but please hold that and there'll be a and a for the whole, you know, panel uh, once everybody's done. Uh, but anyway, you should definitely expect that. Uh, mingling, uh, again, we I recommend this. I, you know, part of me is I'm not a... <laughs> natural born mingler <laughs> kind of have to force myself to, to do it uh, but it sure makes the talk easier if you mingle a little, a little bit before or after you know students uh, typically don't like it when you just rush out the classroom you know if they wanted to talk to you a little bit uh, some, some students like to mingle a little bit get to know you a little bit and that, that's fine uh, following up with the audience members afterward I guess I kind of preempted that one uh, but yeah sometimes you have a place you have to go right afterward <laughs> So, so you might even have to apologize for that. Say, so, you know, I like to stay in chat, but you'll know, have another appointment or another class that I have to get to. Because a lot of people do appreciate this uh, follow-up. You know, some people almost feel obligated to do it. You know, I think that's kind of a mistake. But uh, you know, especially if you're somebody important, you know, they, they might just want to be uh, get that little bit of one-on-one -on -one attention. Maybe that's something they look forward to. You know, why would you want to? I mean, don't be so full of yourself that you can't be honored by that. You know, that, that should be flattering. All right, field questions. Uh, oh, field question. Field. <laughs> what am I saying? How to field questions, not questions about your field. <laughs> All right, pause before answering. All right, so somebody asks you a question, you could just you know, pause a little bit. You don't have to immediately start blurting stuff out. Uh, being honest, you know, what do you know if you don't know the answer? Uh, appreciation is good, you know, especially because if you think that this person, you know, this is one of those people that experiences no fear. <laughs> uh, you know, they, they had to work up some nerve to ask this question. And maybe they're a little nervous and it didn't come out quite the way they wanted it to. Uh, but, you know, you should be appreciative. You know, they took the time, they mustered up the courage to ask the question. And so the least you can do is thank them, hopefully by name. You know, thank you. Now, Jonathan, uh, for this question, you know, I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, you're participating. Uh, we appreciate that. You know, even if the question is not all that great or profound or insightful, who cares, right? Uh, be concise, right? Because you uh, might have other questions. 
that people don't like the if you feel like you spend, spend all the question that the Q&A session on this one question uh, that's probably not very uh, good and kind of might, might offend the other people that had questions uh, reframing the question to match your agenda so did they give us an example of that <laughs> nope <laughs> and one of the books so uh, what was the example I'm trying to remember it was something about somebody asked them if something like well well this can you guarantee that this software will uh, decrease employee turnaround or something like that and they uh, kind of reap instead of saying no I can't guarantee I make no guarantees <laughs> instead of saying something like that they kind of re reframed it as uh, you know what well, well this is what the software will do right it'll <laughs> enhance communication I don't something along those lines again coming back to that agenda oh, oh never mind we do have examples of each one of these <laughs> great as this is what everybody dreads the most yeah you don't know the answer somebody asks you this question maybe you know it but you're kind of up there you're nervous you experience mental blank out it's happened to me it seems to happen to me every time <laughs> <laughs> like two minutes after the class I'm like oh god I forgot everything oh. uh, but anyway this is the less effective way I guess I haven't really heard that concern yet I think that managers might have a concern like that but he continued using the system they're basically saying I've never even thought about that before it seemed like you haven't really thought about it <laughs> kind of unprepared uh, let's look at the second example I'm not prepared to give a good answer to that question right now but I think we certainly need to address it perhaps the HR team can ask some of our contacts company you know so you get the idea there right it's it's more respectful shows that you're yeah you're not saying you know the answer you're kind of admitting you don't in a way but you'd be much more uh, strategic about it and then showing appreciation oh this is the worst let's look at this one in detail because this really bugs me it's a question do you think there's a risk that because the feedback is public managers and employees will avoid sharing their candid and real candid and real views of another's performance so you don't want to say actually <laughs> you know I don't think you should ever say actually like this because it just comes always comes across as condescending and well they say this is a good rational response well maybe could be improved with additional validation of the questioner <laughs> yeah so maybe it's correct uh but this somehow this is just not a very good strategy like actually <laughs> you know, nobody likes being corrected uh, this is the, the thing that i, I think i <clears throat> doesn't get stressed enough don't ever correct somebody publicly uh, unless it is just absolutely necessary and, and critical that you do so you're almost always better off uh, just ignoring it or if it really is significant you know after the talk you could approach the person privately one-on-one and say you know there's there's one spot there I just want to mention you know you might want to look at the uh, <laughs> at your facts on that or you know find some diplomatic way to put it uh, but assuredly correcting them as you're giving the talk is at the, at the very least uh, going to distract them uh, but might possibly upset them or start destroying or damaging their confidence levels you know it really can even come across as shaming uh to them so I, I just would never do that and I, unfortunately i get a lot of students that feel like this this earns the brownie points somehow if they can like catch the professor making an error <laughs> and correct them <laughs> on the spot uh and really you know i could tell you as a professor that does not make me more no matter what professors say about oh yes i'm glad you uh feel free to to speak you know all that yeah 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 but you know but at the end of the day you're thinking man this is I sure wish this person hadn't been so rude and disrespectful I wish they just had told me about it after you know the, the class was over <laughs> it's a little bit of behind the scenes there for you <laughs> and I would say that's probably even more true of a you know business type unless they unless they specifically say something like you know I don't know what I'm uh, you know I could make mistakes here please feel free to point out anything uh, that I, I get wrong if they say something like that then fine they're asking for it basically uh, but otherwise you know you really want to weigh uh, you know is it really that important if so fine but you know otherwise you might uh, <laughs> uh, not do that all right uh, examples of being concise uh, question you've mentioned a few success stories of Peakster computing could you mention some examples at other companies you've talked to uh, so less effective sure 
I could give you lots of examples. <laughs> Let me tell you about three other companies. <laughs> Continues on for three to four minutes, largely re repeating the same key points. Yeah, this is not good. <laughs> they don't give the example of, maybe I skipped the example of being uh, more concise, but uh, you can certainly refer people to, uh, you know, especially if it's something you've covered already or you're going to cover, you know, just refer back to that or, you know, say you could follow up. Uh, I like that idea. You know, I'll follow up with you over email. We can talk more about that, or we could talk more after the, you know, the panel's done or whatever. The talk, we'll talk about that after class, right? So, question: I'm quite skeptical. Reframing the question to match your agenda. Yeah, this is the one about the software and the employee turnover. <laughs> well, actually, I can't guarantee anything. So, this question challenges the basic premise that technology can make a difference. Now, compare that to this one. I think it's fair to say that we can reduce employee turnover by focusing on performance in a more positive and motivating way. What we learned from these other companies is that they use the software successfully because they created a culture of performance. You know, so obviously this, this idea of the culture of performance would be one of the themes they covered in their talk, so they're just kind of coming back to that. Um, All right, perfect, uh, presently, <laughs> present effectively in teams. Sometimes it takes a couple tries. All right, so this is a, a very different kind of situation. I haven't done this too often, but sometimes you will be partnered up with somebody. You know, actually, uh, thinking on this, uh, Dr. Hyman and I, or Jamie, as I call him, <laughs> and we've done a couple of presentations as teens, and I just, you know, I thought it was great. Uh, it's a lot of fun uh, working with him. Uh, <clears throat> but I've had other times as, as a student in, cl in the class and group projects where people just <laughs> didn't work well at all. <laughs> Uh, so I could wish I'd have had this information back then. Um, but anyway, let's just say you're going to be up there with three or four other people, different roles, class project or your first a professional presentation. And so one is to be clear with one another about your objectives and the key messages, right? So everybody's looked at the same PowerPoint. You know which slides are going to be covered by, you know, by each person. You know, it could, again, could be three or four people instead of just uh, one partner. I mean, one partner is plenty of that to me to have to worry about. But, uh, you know, again, the more people, that's just the more important it is uh, that you are clear on all these uh, objectives. Uh, decide on the presentation role. You know, so usually people say, you can cover this part about the statistics. <clears throat> I'll focus on the, you know, I'll do this part and this bit. I'll introduce the panel, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, stand together and present a united front. So if, if you're a speaker, you know, if you're up there with, again, two or three other people and this person's speaking, uh, then you don't want to be looking at your phone or you know, out in a daydreaming or something. Uh, you you kind of want to role model or model the behavior you want from the audience, right? So you're, you know, looking like you're focusing uh, attention on the speaker, uh, not distracting in any kind of way that you can help. Uh, referring to each other's points, and that's always a really good thing. You know, yes, and I like to follow up on what uh, Luke was saying there about uh, software. <laughs> now, that's a nice segue, a nice transition, uh, which brings us to that last point there, transitioning effectively. And so I have seen groups that just kind of break apart, right? That just one speaker stops suddenly, and uh, the other person is like, is it my turn? <laughs> is it my turn now? <laughs> yeah, yes. Oh, uh, uh, and it's just this terrible transitions uh, but then you know, if they prepare a little bit better it's very smooth and they say no I like to turn things over to, uh, to Kevin he will, Kevin is going to talk about uh, the statistics you know easy going uh, being a supportive audience member oh I, I love this uh, so that's yeah just it's a big transition for people <laughs> speaking of transitions uh, when you move from being uh, say an undergrad to a graduate student uh, or when you uh, get your first job and you're at a business meeting. And, you know, it's a very different experience for many students than just being that student in the back of the classroom, not really, uh, not, you know, only about 50% there. <laughs> you know, suddenly it's a very different situation. Uh, so you're not more than just, you know, this passive recipient. You're, you're part of this team. You're part of this company. For a graduate student, you're kind of part of the staff now, or you're part of the, you're trying to become a part of the field. Uh, basically, you want to be more professional, seeing yourself in the, in the role of a professional scholar or teacher or whatever it is. So you really want to take this role seriously. Remember, it's it's a lot about you. And I, once again, I know I keep coming back to the musician, <laughs> but, you know, if you've ever played, performed any kind of thing, 
even a sports, you know that the audience makes a huge difference. You know, if you have uh, ever played a sport, for example, and you have this really receptive, uh, engaged audience, you know, people that are cheering, you know, that really adds, it's not just fun for them, but it really makes you perform better. You know, and same thing as a musician, uh, same thing as a teacher. <clears throat> you know, I've had classes where the students, you know, they, they come in, they don't look <laughs> look up the whole time, it just gets so depressing. You just walk out of there feeling like you, you're in the wrong line of work and you, you should quit and <laughs> do something else. <laughs> uh, but then you might have another class where everybody's really engaged and, you know, to take, to take the classes seriously and you feel like you're, a, you know, you walk away like you're a million dollars, right? Uh, so really that's a lot about them. And you can be that person in the audience uh, for that professor, for that manager. Um, you know, if you take on this role seriously, not just think about yourself there to, <laughs> to uh, sort of while away the hour, uh, but instead think about what can I do to kind of engage and help here and project some energy. Uh, you know, sometimes just paying attention, taking notes. Uh, one of the things I got into the habit of doing as a graduate student was just I'd come in because, you know, I taught classes. I knew what annoyed me. So what I'd do is I'd come in and sit, you know, right, not maybe not right at the front, but, you know, close where the professor could see me. <laughs> then I would conspicuously take out my notes, notebook, open that up, put the date on there, put the heading on there. <laughs> And then uh, when I saw the professor was ready, getting ready to start, uh, you know, the lecture or whatever, does that make sure I was looking at them, not distracted, not talking to anybody else? And, you know, I found that that not only, yeah, I mean, in a way is nerdy, <laughs> but I think the professor on some level appreciated that. And I think the other students in the class too, and you know, I wasn't the only one doing that kind of thing, right? So they'd say, well, these other students, you know, look, look at Matt over here. He's, you know, he really seems to be, uh, taking this seriously, so maybe we should too. So kind of change the whole gestalt of the room. You know, sometimes I think you can make a living just being this professional student. <laughs> if you want a little extra cash, just go around and say, hey, would you like me to be a professional student in your classroom and kind of model uh, this behavior? Because it really can make a, a big difference. Uh, avoiding behaviors that may distract the presenter. I mean, the every professor I talk to and TA, they got the same complaint. They say, my God, what are we going to do? All the students are on their devices. They're not even looking up. Uh, they're, they're chatting with their friends on these uh, iPhones all day. And if I try to take the device away, they, they think that I'm a, you know, a, a dictator or something and they hate me or they even refuse to, to quit doing it. And, <laughs> you know, I have had students before where I, I had a policy on my syllabus and I said, if you are on your iPhone or what? I guess it wasn't an iPhone back then. <laughs> if you're texting on your phone, I will. No, it was Facebook. Yes, I said, if, if you're on Facebook, I will uh, take points away. And I remember a student, I, I said, look, you know, you're on Facebook. I've said it's on the syllabus. You know, it's just kind of, kind of warning. I don't want to have to take the points away. And she told me that she would be okay with losing points because uh, she could not, she was not willing uh, to turn off uh, Facebook <laughs> during my class. <laughs> that was just too important to her and it was worth the uh, the loss of points. So, I mean, I thought that was just <laughs> bizarre. <laughs> you know, I, I really think people should uh, not let it come to that. And, and I think that you can you can become addicted to uh, your, your phone, uh, your device, and just the way you might, you know, when it gets to the point like that where it's uh, impacting your, you know, professional life, you probably should, uh, you know, get some help. <laughs> <laughs> not, not joking. I, I'm sorry I laughed. You know, that's, that's a serious thing. You, sh you should get some uh, some therapy uh, to help with that because you should be able to, you know, focus for 45 minutes or whatever on, on some other activity. Uh, let's see. Uh, make comments and ask questions that help the presenter to stay on message. Another good. You know, coming back to this idea of the professional student, right? Uh, and I have heard presenters will get together with some confederates, as I like to call them, and they'll say, here's the question I'd like you to ask me. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I had a colleague that would do this and he would even give me a question. It wasn't Jamie, uh, in case you're curious. And he'd say, here's a question I would like for you to ask. <laughs> if nobody asks any questions, <laughs> uh, could you ask this question? Maybe something that he was prepared, well prepared to answer made him look good. Um, but yeah, comments. I like to think about these preachers I used to listen to growing up. And there, there'd be these uh, called deacons. Which would be, I guess it would kind of be like the professional uh, audience, right? The the super serious um, audience members, and they would, you know, when the preacher would say something, 
powerful, I suppose. They, they would say, amen, brother, <laughs> or preach on, <laughs> preach it. <laughs> uh, something like that. It, that kind of sounds silly, but and that was the idea, right? To kind of pump the person up, you know, keep the energy levels high. You probably wouldn't want to do that as a student, though. <laughs> business meeting. <laughs> Amen, Michael. <laughs> uh, see, for most business presentations, you share professional interest with the presenter. As a result, the success of the presentation is a team effort. And again, so try not to see yourself as this passive audience member. It's not like going to a movie and it doesn't make any difference. You're, you could sit there and, and be completely in a different place mentally during that movie. It's not going to impact the movie. A very different situation than any kind of live presentation or performance. Now, the audience does make a big difference. And sometimes I think if you want to have a good time, you want to see a good presentation, you want to see even like the music, you want to go have a great time listening to a live band. Uh, don't just blame it all on the band. It's not 100% that band's responsibility. A lot of it is, is you. You know, Are you getting up and dancing? Uh, are you uh, cheering, clapping loudly, uh, letting, letting that band... Uh, you know, giving that band some, <laughs> you know, I always think about this, you know, it took a lot of guts for them to even get up there and kind of coming back to this theme of uh, being nervous, <laughs> you know, so they're already, uh, you know, they've done their part, uh, is the way I look at it, and I would like to encourage them on, and, and kind of selfishly, because I know that the more confident they are, the probably the better they'll play and the better time everybody will have, right, it's, you know, I shouldn't just be expecting them to carry the, the weight. All right, chapter takeaways. Uh, presentation delivery impacts credibility, right? The competence, the character, the caring. Do you care about your audience? <laughs> Are you of a sound moral character? All that stuff. Now you should have uh, authenticity, confidence, and influence, or that's what you should, you should strive to have. We talked about the softened model of nonverbal communication. So even uh, the way we're standing or your arms crossed, it's not a very good model. You want to kind of be more open with your body language. Uh, using the slides and handouts effectively. Interacting effectively with that audience. Uh, presenting with the team. Different uh, strategies called for there. And then uh, lastly, I really like this, uh, being a supportive audience member. So not just showing up and sitting in the back and <laughs> uh, staring at Facebook or whatever, uh, but really trying to be engaged, taking your responsibility seriously and, and realizing you're, you know, whether that class succeeds or fails has a lot to do with you as an audience member as much as it does that, you know, poor old uh, <laughs> professor, guitar player, <laughs> whoever it is. All right, so that will do it for uh, chapter 15. Uh, the end. Uh, it's not really the end, though, because if you got any questions, comments, uh, stories you'd like to share, I always love reading those. And so I hope you enjoyed this uh, lecture, and uh, see you next time.